Okay, so good evening, everyone. Welcome to your drafting and interpreting financial statements revision session. My name's Louise. I'm one of the distance learning tutors here at First Intuition. And hopefully you will find this helpful. Tonight, we're going to go through our consolidated statements, which is our task five. So we'll get straight on with it. Some of you, I think, will have done this before. Those of you who haven't, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat box. I'll do my best to answer them. And I'll try not to go too quickly. I know this is a bit of a learning curve. Okay. So, bills acquired 80% of the share capital. Oh, get that in the right place. Sorry. Put that over there so I can see you. Sorry. I just need to be able to see the chat. Um, so, bills acquired 80% of the share capital of Moons on the 1st of January 2004 for, for £420,000. At that date, Moons had issued ordinary share capital of £100,000 and retained earnings were £260,000. Shown below are the statements of financial positions for the two companies as at the 31st of December 2004. And additional information is shown below. In this task, in your task five, you may get a consolidated profit and loss. You may get a consolidated statement of financial position, or you might get both. Something to know is if you only get one, there's going to be more adjustments because the task needs to have enough content for you to be able to pick up the marks. If you get both, there'll be less adjustments. It's really that simple. So the first things we need to know in this task are who are the parent and who's a subsidiary. Really important. We do not get these mixed up. So Bills acquired 80% of the capital of Moons. So Bills are our parent and Moons are our subsidiary. Okay. Also note that there's always going to be a portion that they haven't brought. So Bills acquired 80% of the share capital of Moons. So there's 20% that they didn't acquire. That's always going to be the case. It, <clears throat> the percentage will vary but they're never going to have just brought all of it. There's always going to be a portion left over. Okay. The reason for that is that is the non-controlling interest. And that's something that IIT want to test in your financial statements unit. Okay. We also need to make note of the date that they brought it. So they brought it on the 1st of January, 2004. This is the date of acquisition. Really important that you don't get this mixed up with the date that we're preparing the financial statements as of the 31st of December. Now, this is all over one period, but you might find that they purchased it on the 1st of January 2004, but we're doing the, the De uh, December accounts for 2007. Doesn't really matter, but always make note of the dates. Try, don't get them mixed up. Worth putting them on your piece of paper so you don't have to keep scrolling back up and down. Okay. So we're going to have been asked to calculate some things. Let's have a look. What have we got here? We've got non-controlling interest, goodwill, and retained earnings. And then we've got some working boxes for these as well. Okay. For the 31st of December, 2004. Nearly missed that bit out. Okay. So we're going to start with goodwill. And we haven't been told that there's any impairment to the goodwill. So that means that the goodwill at the end of the year is the same as what it was at acquisition. OK, sometimes there will be an impairment. There isn't an impairment here. OK. I like to start with goodwill because it reminds me to kind of work through it in, in chronological order. So goodwill is calculated at the date of acquisition. So it's calculated first. So it just reminds me, just a good way to remember that's at the date of acquisition. Okay. So we're going to start with the consideration. That's the first thing that goes in our goodwill box. And hopefully you're all happy with the term consideration. It means what they paid for it. Right. So let's have a quick look back up. What were we told? They paid 420,000. So let's go back to our goodwill working. Let's get my pen on. And in here, we're going to put proceeds. And that is 420. 
really important thing here remember that we're working in thousands I see so many students lose so many marks because in here they might have got 420 zero 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 and it, it does show us just check it's just really important you could get all of your calculations correct but if you do not write it as of the thousands or whatever it may be that they've asked you to write it as you're going to lose the mark so just double check that okay so next we need to add on the bit that they didn't buy so this is our non-controlling interest let's go back up here so this is the value of the company at the date of acquisition not the date that we're preparing the accounts let's have a look the date the value of the company at the date of acquisition is going to be our hundred thousand pound share capital Ooh. plus our two hundred and sixty thousand pound retained earnings so that gives us three hundred and sixty thousand and the non-controlling interest that's the bit that they didn't buy okay i hope you're happy with that so that's 20 percent okay because bills brought 80 percent so moon still own 20 percent so we do our 360 times 20 percent gives us 72,000 I'm always hitting that rubber <laughs> it gives us 72,000 in fact it gives us 72 after what I've just said um and then we can add this to our consideration So NCI, Ooh. is 72. Is everyone happy with where we're going with this? Yep, good, okay. Just let me know if I go too fast, all right? So the next thing we need to do is deduct the value of the company at the date of acquisition okay so what have we got we have our share capital of 100 and our retained earnings of 260 so that would be a negative 360 and this gives us a total of 132 let me double check that i'm sure it gives us a total of 132 <laughs> Uh, sorry too many screens here yeah that's fine okay so next well actually before we move on i just want to say if we did have an impairment if there was an impairment to goodwill that would go here that would you would put another line underneath here and you would deduct the impairment okay there is no impairment here but just so you're aware this you would put it in this goodwill box okay so next we've got our nci our non-controlling interest and we prepare this using the date that we're preparing the accounts for which is our december date okay so we know that the shares haven't changed let's go back up and have a quick look there we go there's been no issue so the nci still own 20 percent of the hundred thousand pound share capital which is twenty thousand pound so in here We'll put our share capital. Of 20. Ooh. There we go. And next, um, well, the non-controlling interest also own a portion of the retained earnings and if we look at uh, the retained earnings have changed in the period yeah so at the date of acquisition the retained earnings were 260 which we were told and now they're 318 so that means they made a profit in the period which is great the calculation that we need to do here is 
318 times 20%. And that gives us 63.6. Oh, that blooming rubber. 63.6. <laughs> okay. Giving us a total of 83.6. I don't need the calculator for that. Okay. Next, we have our retained earnings box. So the retained earnings is 100% of the parents' retained earnings, which is 560. So just put RE, 560. Then we have to calculate how much of the parents, or how much the parents own of the profits of the subsidiary. So the parents have only owned their share of the subsidiary for the year. Right. This is the time where it would make a difference if we was looking at the accounts three years down the line, for instance. This means that they only share, they only they only own a share of the profits since the date of acquisition. So the post acquisition profit that's gonna be our scroll back up. <laughs> Okay. Post acquisition profit is going to be the 318, which is what the parents had before. That's December 2004. Sorry, that's what they've got now. <laughs> Minus the 260, which is what they had at acquisition. And that gives us 58. However, they don't actually own all of that, do they? They only own 80% because they didn't buy it all. So we have to times it by 80%. Get my calculator real quick. And that gives us 46.4. So the total here will be a 606. Four. Everyone happy? Yeah, nothing particularly awful there. Just going to have a quick sip of my drink. You're not 100% sure on the non-controlling interest. Okay, let's find our non-controlling interest. So our non-controlling interest is the share capital that stays at 20 because it hasn't changed. Okay, the NCI, they own, well, start from the beginning. The NCI, the, chain, the shares haven't changed. There's been no issues of shares during the period. So that means that the NCI still own 20% of the 100,000 that they had at the beginning of the period, okay? If we go back up here, you can see, okay? So that would be 20,000, which is what we've put in here. All right, what have I done with my pen? There it is. Okay, so that's the 20,000 that we've put in here. The NCO also own a portion of the retained earnings and these have changed in the period so on the date of acquisition we were told that retained earnings were 260,000 but now they're 318,000 which means that the company's made a profit over the year and the NCI the non-controlling interest they own 20% of those profits okay so you would do the 318,000 profits multiplied by 20% to give you the 663,600, which is what we've put here, which I have not put in good handwriting, which doesn't help you at all. So this is our 
Ça passe ça? I'll keep going, but if you have any more questions, I can come back to it a bit later, okay? Okay, so next we have boards. Oh, okay, all right then, that's fine. Okay, let's scroll back to where we need to be. Okay, so now we have boards and boots. Let's have a look at see what it says about those. Boards Limited acquired 70% of the share capital of Boots Limited a number of years ago. You've been provided with the statements of profit or loss for the two companies together with some additional information. Just what we love. Okay. It's really important. Oh, well, let me keep going. Sorry. <laughs> Prepare the consolidated statement of profit or loss for the year ending the 30th of March 2002. You do not need to use the workings to achieve full marks in this task. It does. It tells us this here. However, if you use these working boxes down here for your revenue, your cost of sales and your inventory, and you say you get the first two lines, you put something here and you put something here and they're correct, but you add it up wrong and the number you put here is incorrect and you take this incorrect number and put it up here, you wouldn't get the mark here because you've got it incorrect. However, if the examiner can see that down here, what you put was correct or you was calculating it in the correct way and you just made a mistake down here, you can still get marks for that. So highly recommend it is worth using these working boxes. Plus it just stops you getting mixed up. Some of these things, like, you, you know, you might be able to just do the calculations in your head. You might think it's quicker. But by writing them down and seeing them in front of you, you're less likely to make mistakes. Plus, if you do make a mistake, you have those chances of picking up more marks in the working boxes. So I really highly recommend that you use them. OK. So in our additional information, it says sales were made to boards from boots. Now, this is why I like this task, because it's slightly different to what we normally see. Sales are made to boards. Boards are our parent and boots are the sub. So in this case, the subsidiary has sold to the parent. Really, really, really important that you notice that. Um, there is a slight difference. It's mostly the same, but there's just a slight difference to how we handle this. Re just really important. That's why I like this particular task. Okay. So our subsidiary sold to our parent. The value of the sale was £112,000. And they make a 40% markup on cost of all of its goods. Yeah. At the end of the period, a quarter of these goods were still in infantry. So can anyone tell me what the value of the sale was? Make a 40% mark upon cost. That's right, 156,800. Okay. At the end of the period, we know now that a quarter of the goods were still in inventory. This is always going to happen. There's always going to be some left because this is what makes this task interesting. Okay. This is, again, something that the AIT like to examine. It's always going to be that way. There's always, they're not just going to say, oh, they've sold, that they made a sale and then it's all been sold because then there would be no pub adjustment. Okay. So we're going to have an intercompany sale to adjust for and also a pup adjustment, okay, because we've got some inventory still in stock. So what else have we got down here? Got our revenue working. 
our cost of sales working and our inventory adjustment. So let's just get rid of these. Right, so kind of makes sense to start with the inventory working because you can't do cost of sales until you've got your inventory calculation. So our sales. For 112. Yep. And our cost of sales, we know, would have been our 156,000. Hold on a second. Um, that means, sorry, that our 112,000, I'm getting myself all mixed up now, our 112,000 must be. 140%. Yeah, I was getting there. <laughs> Through my own mind then, I'm really sorry. If it's a 40% markup on cost, that means that £112,000 is 140% of the cost of sales figure. So the way I like to work this out is to do the £112,000 divided by 140 to get 1% and then times it back up again by 100 to get 100%. Okay, so let's do... Uh, £112,000 divided by 140 times by 100 this gives us 80000 okay? So, cost of sales is 80. Ooh. Okay, and... This gives us, oh, we've got to take this off. It's helpful. This gives us a profit of 32. Okay. Now what we need to show is the cost of these goods to the group. And we want to know what the cost was when they came into the group. What we don't want is to end up with an issue where one company sells to another company for a higher price. Then that other company sells back to the first company for an even higher price. Suddenly, both companies are showing a profit when actually neither of them have sold anything outside of the group. Okay, so we only want to show the value of the goods to the cost of when they came into the company, into the group. So we need to work out the profit made on the goods left in stock. We were told we've got a quarter of them. So we do uh, 32. Let's have a look. We'll do it here. We would do a uh, 32 divided by four because that's our quarter. I'm checking all my maths now. <laughs> Which I advise you doing in, in your exam as well. Is eight. Okay. So our pup adjustment is our eight. So next we're going to do our cost of sales and we're going to take the cost of sales figure for each company from the profit and loss. So for boards it was 857 and for boots it was 118. Okay. And with the cost of sales, we only want to include purchases from outside of the group. And we know that the sub sold to the parent. So that means in the parent's purchases figure, there's £112,000 that was paid to the sub. Okay. So in our cost of sales working box, we need to do our intercompany sales. and take off the 112. Oh, what's really important to know here that it wouldn't have mattered if the parent sold to the sub or the sub sold to the parent. We still need to take the purchase price out of the cost of sales calculation, okay? And next we would add 
our put, which was our eight. And we'll just add all that up. Okay, so we add the put. That's I'm really bad at explaining this. Sorry. Well, I'm gonna let Catherine answer that. Well, I'll add this up. I know she's lurking somewhere. <laughs> Eight, five, seven, plus one, one, eight. Minus one, one, two, plus eight. It was eight, seven, one. Catherine will be with you in a minute, Andrea. Oh, where was we? Eight, seven, one. Okay. Okay, so we've done this. And the next thing to be aware of is the double entry for this. It would be a debit to cost of sales because we've taken too much off and a credit to inventory would reduce the value of the assets. Okay, this is because if the goods are sold at a profit, they're going to be valued too high in our closing inventory calculation. Okay. So again, this adjustment is exactly the same if the parent sells to the sub or the sub sells to the parent. We're always going to debit the cost of sales and the profit and loss and credit inventory in the statement of financial position. I feel like I've just got my head screwed back on again. <laughs> and there we go. Now I know where I'm at. Okay. So we've done our cost of sales box. Next, we have our revenue box. Thanks, Catherine. Lost my head for a second there. <laughs> so, revenue workings. Anyway, in the revenue box, we have our revenue for boards. Oh. Which was two, four, four, six. And our revenue for boots, which was a 712. Ooh, what's going on with my pen? There we go. It's not playing ball with me tonight. Okay. So again, in the revenue calculation, we only want to sell, show sales that have been made to third parties. So we don't want to show the intercompany sales because this would be inflating the sales of the group. So again, in our revenue box, this would, we have to put our intercompany sales. And we're going to deduct this and it's 112. Okay, so this gives us a total of 3056. So we need a job. We're getting there. We're going to go back to here and we're basically just adding things up. Okay. This is the statement of profit and loss for boards group. Now we know our revenue was 3056. And our cost of sales was eight. Double check our cost of sales. Was 871. And our gross profit will be our 3056 minus 871 equals 2185. Okay. Next, we have our distribution costs, which... Let me, Got it up over here as well. <laughs> Next, we have our distribution class, which was our 455. And our admin expenses, which was 190. And that gives us an operating profit of.
1504A. Okay, and our finance cost then was, where's our finance cost gone? <laughs> 85. So we take off our 85. 1455. Profit before tax. And next, we've got our tax amount, which was our 438. Which gives us a profit of 1017. And the very last thing that we need to do then is to split this profit between the owners of the parent and the non-controlling interest. Okay. So this is where we need to be really careful with the put. This is where it does differ if the sub sold to the parent and the parent sold to the put to the sub. Sorry. So because the sub sold to the parent, that means the profit is sitting in the subs accounts, right? And if the profit is sitting in the subs accounts, the subs need to take their share of the PUP adjustment, right? Our subsidiary needs to take their share of the PUP adjustment. The non-controlling interest, they will get 30% of the subsidiary's profit, but we need to take off the PUP. So we have a 313. Minus at eight. Oh, wow, that's some bad handwriting. Sorry, I don't know how I expect you to, you to read that. <laughs> Try again. So we have a 313 minus eight multiplied by 30%. Oh. PUP stands for prov provision for unrealized profit. That's why we call it PUP. <laughs> so we're doing our 313. It's okay. Minus 8. Times 30%. Which gives us 91.50. Oh. So NCI. 91.50. Yeah. So the last thing to note is the rest of the balance goes to the parent. So once you've calculated this bit here, there is the only calculation you have to do is your profit which was your 1017 minus the bit that the non-controlling interest got. So we do our 1017 minus the 9150 95.50, and that goes to the parent. Ooh. Okay, that is it. That's that whole task done. I know it's something that people hate. It's something that I generally love, but even I got myself mixed up for a second there and had to look, relook at what on earth I was doing. So if you feel like you're getting a little bit lost, if you feel like it's almost running away with you, just take a second Re recalculate yourself look at the figures and and just start again okay i don't mean from the beginning i mean pick up where you left off and start again because sometimes it can get a bit messy just remember in the first part really important to know like your goodwill is from the date of acquisition so that's why we always recommend you do your goodwill first because it, it came first just a good way of remembering um and remember your pup adjustments 
And if the parent sold to the sub, you wouldn't need to make a change here. But because the sub is sold to the parent, you need to take that out. Okay. I don't think there's anything else that's massively horrendous in here. It can just seem like a lot. So just work through it step by step the same way you would if you was doing um, your cash flows, for instance, in your task one, your task two. Just take it slow, work through it one stage at a time. And always remember really important things with these tasks. If you made a mistake, say, for instance, if you put in your gross profit wrong, that's not this task ruined. OK, so if you put your gross profit in wrong, but everything else that you put down here was correct, you would only lose this one mark. OK, so don't give up. Don't let it get yourself in a fluster and think, oh, my God, I've ruined the whole task. I'm going to lose 20 marks. I've failed the exam. That's not how this works. OK, it's one really nice thing that the AAT do is that if you make a mistake here, but everything else down here is correct, you will pick up all of those marks. So just keep yourself calm. And if you struggle with anything. Yeah, that's right. But what would happen there if your gross profit was wrong no if your gross profit was wrong and then you took off all of these say for instance if i had put the gross profit here of 2300 okay so i did that instead of 2185 i then went on to do 2300 Minus 455, minus 190, minus 140, minus 85, minus 438, right? So I took off all the things that I was supposed to take off, but I was taking them off 2,300 instead of 2185. If my answer here was 2,300 minus these things, I would get, you would get all of the marks, okay? Because you've shown the examiner that you knew that you had to get your gross profit and deduct distribution, your admin, your finance and your tax. And that's what they're looking to say, right, she's got a gross profit. What does she do with it next? If the gross profit figure's wrong, that's not the be all and end all as long as you have deducted the correct things below. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. So I'm going to stop the recording now and then I'll talk a bit more.